All right, good evening. Um, so I've had kind of a, a bit of a rough time here, um, kind of getting this put together. I had trouble getting it printed. I lost some information on the pr print of it. So um, I'm gonna make the best of this. So um, in a lot of ways, uh, first off, I'd like to thank Patrick for the nice introduction and for talking about love because love is definitely going to be a big part of this because it is is one of the issues. So uh, progressive Christianity is a gigantic topic. Um, it's far too large for me to stand up here and talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then for us to be able to answer questions. Um, but we're going to make the best of it. And if it's something that we have to follow up on again. Um, he said that I was well versed in it. I have read a lot. I've really studied a lot getting ready for this. And I found that the more I've studied, kind of the more confused I've got. So um, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it was. So some of these things are, um, I'm still trying to work out in my own mind. So... Um, you know what, if we can't answer your question, um, I'll get you an answer. I feel like I'm a pretty good resource person. I'm more, of, I'm probably a better resource person uh, than I am a stand up here talking about thing person, but you know, person, but that's, you know what, that's what it is. So, um, and I do have some resources for you and I'll get to those uh, shortly. So um, progressive Christianity, honestly, if you, if you only remember one thing I say tonight, this needs to be it. Progressive Christianity is really just liberal Christianity. Um, and it's been around for ever, probably. Um, in 1923, uh, Jay Gresham Machen, um, who is somebody you should be familiar with, um, he is definitely well worth your time. He wrote a book in 1923, so 100 years ago almost, uh, called Christianity and Liberalism. And... Um, he made the point that um, liberal Christianity wasn't really just another branch of Christianity, but it really was a completely separate religion and was not Christianity at all. Um, I would make the same claim, excuse me, I would make the same claim about progressive Christianity. I mean, it is, um, there, are, there are some aspects of it that um, definitely would forfeit um, being called Christianity, in my opinion. So when you hear progressive Christianity, think liberal Christianity, and it'll give you a pretty good idea what's going on. So um, it's fascinating that 100 years later, Machen's book is still valid and still worth reading, um, and it's probably something that uh, most everybody should read. Now, one of the things about... Um, about that progressive Christianity as it's related to liberal Christianity is it's been around for a long, long time. It has. The most difficult part, and, and honestly the reason that I got a little bogged down in the studies of it, is progressive Christianity sounds really, really good. And the reason it sounds really good is that because a lot of the things you will hear are half-truths. And so when you hear a half-truth, if you're not well-versed in the doctrine that um, is being attacked, it, it honestly, it sounds pretty good. Um, the problem with half-truths is they're not truths, um, therefore they're lies, um, but they sound really, really good. And so a lot of this stuff is really subtle. Machen recognized that 100 years ago, and uh, as we're going to look at it tonight, um, we will we'll see that as well. So um, what I decided to do when I was putting this together because it was such a, a big thing, um, and I'm going to get you, let me go ahead and get that out of the way. I'm going to give you um, some resources if you want to check into these and uh, um, anybody that, you know, ask the question later, anything like that if I need to. Um, American Gospel 2. Um, American Gospel, the first one was about the... Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank. 
The prosperity gospel. Thank you. Um, the first one was about the prosperity gospel. It was really, really good. They did a follow-up, and it's uh, like 175 minutes. Uh, I watched it last night again. Um, but it is on progressive Christianity. It is well worth your time in the video. So it's American Gospel 2, Christ Crucified, um, is the subtitle of that one. Another person that kind of, I've, I've followed her for a while, um, and um, some of her stuff will make its way into, um, into my thing tonight, but what is a book by Elisa Childers um, called Another Gospel. Um, with a question mark after it. Well worth your time. I have that one as well. Um, she's famous because she was, uh, if you're into the music industry at all, Elisa Childers was um, one-third of Zoe Girl, if you were ever into um, the Christian pop scene uh, probably 15 years ago. Um, but she, she had an experience in a progressive church um, that almost cost her her, um, her belief system. I mean, it really shook her to her core. Um, one of the interesting things about American Gospel um, is it kind of, it counters her story with the story of Bart Campolo, who is Tony Campolo's son. Tony Campolo is well-known liberal Christian. Um, Bart Campolo actually had this crisis of faith and came out on the other side, and he is full-blown atheist. Um, man, seems like a really likable, really nice guy, but he, so they both went through this. She came out on the side with a stronger faith than she ever had. He came out of it as an atheist, but both in this um, liberal Christianity, this progressive Christianity. And so the, the counter of their two stories is really fascinating in that. So those are the two um, that I recommend. And then the one that I'm actually going to use kind of as the, the basis and the core for what I'm talking about tonight. Um, there's a book written by um, Michael Kruger. Um, it is called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. It's done by Cruciform Press. It's actually a really short um, I listened to the book twice today um, as, I was, as I was working. Um, unfortunately, I was working, and so it didn't always click, but I, I listened to it twice today. Um, it's pretty short. I mean, it's like an hour and a half to listen to, so I would guess you could probably read it in, in one or two settings. But again, it's The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity by Michael Kruger. Um, he wrote the book as a response to... Uh, a book that was actually written by Philip Gulley, um, and it was about um, 10 principles for progressive Christianity, and so he kind of wrote it as a response and as a counter to those, and he addresses them one by one. And um, he had actually run on to that um, when he was reading a devotional by Richard Rohr, and Richard Rohr is a very, very famous, um, within postmodernism, for any of, but any of you that remember, um, I did a a connect on postmodernism last fall. And so Richard Rohr is kind of a giant in postmodernism, but also in this progressive Christianity because postmodernism is one of the, uh, the tenets of progressive Christianity. So um, I'm going to go through these one at a time. Some of these I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because I don't have a whole lot of time to spend on it. And honestly, some of them I'm still trying to get straight in my mind. So um, if you ask me questions, I might be able to answer the questions on it. If not, I will get you an answer and get back to you. So here are the Ten Commandments um, of progressive Christianity and then uh, at least a little bit on it. Uh, commandment number one, Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Um, man, red lights should be going off right now. Is Jesus a great moral, I mean, is he somebody that we can look to as a great moral leader? Yes, absolutely. That's the half-truth part of it, right? You cannot divorce that from the fact that he is worthy of our worship. He is the God who created all of this. He is um, the Lord of everything around us. He's way more than just a moral teacher. Um, but for the, for the progressive Christian, following Jesus as a good model is preferable to worshiping, worshiping him as divine. He's a guide, but he's not the savior. 
Um, Jesus is a moral example, but he, for us, he's much more than that. So um, that is the first one. He is the divine Lord of the universe. So yes, he is. There's the part of it. But what happens is you end up taking all the stuff that you don't like out of it. Um, honestly, it reminds me, um, I teach history, and Thomas Jefferson basically made his own Bible, and he took out all the stuff that he didn't like about it. And you know what he left in there? He basically left the gospel accounts of Jesus did this, and he did this because he was a great moral leader. This is the first um, commandment of progressive Christianity, that he's a, more of a model for leading, uh, living than he is an object for worship. Second one, affirming pe people's potential is more important than reminding them of their brokenness. That's a big one as well. You know what? I should lift you up and tell you um, that it's going to be okay and not, hey, you got to stop doing what you're doing. What you're doing is sinful. I get this all the time. I have these conversations with my students all the time, and I ask them, I said, look, if I believe you're doing something that is sinful and is harmful to potentially your salvation, it could be that sinful. I said, what is the most loving thing for me to do? Is it to say, hey, you know what, you'll be all right? Or is it in fact to address it directly? And that's not fun at all. It's not fun at all. I would submit that the most loving thing you can do is to address somebody's sin directly in their life because eternity might hang in the balance. So affirming people's potential was more important than reminding them of their brokenness was number two. Number three, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. So kind of related to the first one, but you know what? It's the judge not lest ye be judged. It literally is the only Bible verse that probably everybody on earth knows, and they throw it in your face all the time, um, not understanding that when they're telling you that they're actually judging you. So I, like, if you're into like logic, which I am, um, really kind of funny. So you literally are just judging me by telling me not to judge. So <laughs> rarely do they get that, but um, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. In other words, we're really not supposed to judge. I shouldn't tell you that what you're doing is wrong because then I'm judging. Um, now, from the believer's perspective, we are supposed to judge with right motives, but we are supposed to do that. That When people tell you that, that, that we're not supposed to do that, they're just wrong. We are supposed to do it with right motives, but we absolutely are. Um, we talked about it last week. It has to do with the fruit. Good tree, good fruit. Bad tree, bad fruit. Pretty easy to tell. If I see bad fruit, guess what? We're going to have a conversation. Um, so that's number three. Um, and that has to do with this uh, reconciliation over making judgments. It has to do with the horizontal relationships more than the vertical relationship, right? It has to do with me not wanting to hurt your feelings, but um, ignoring the clear command from God. And so that's number three. Number four, gracious behavior is more important than right belief. And you can see that a lot of these are kind of really, kind of they overlap, and so that's kind of where it gets a little bit difficult. But gracious behavior is more important than right belief. So it's more important for me to be nice than it is for me to point out something that's going on incorrectly. Again, you know what? Is there a partial truth in there? Yeah, like all of these, there really is a partial truth. Should I, I mean, I'm not going to come in guns blazing, right? That doesn't do anybody any good. But I, when I'm doing that, I mean, I'm not going to soft pedal it. I'm not going to sugarcoat. Um, we're going to have that conversation, and it's going to be what it's going to be. So um, gracious behavior is more important than right belief. Absolutely not. Number five, inviting questions is more valuable than supplying answers. Inviting questions is more important than supplying answers. So um, this, the whole thing with questions, it, it literally could be its own connect, um, where um, when you say something, it's like, hey, I'm just asking questions. 
Um, and it's almost like they turn it around. But the question isn't really a question. It's actually a statement. And so it, it kind of gets twisted around a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with questions. I'm not afraid of questions. We're about getting ready to do questions. There will be questions. So um, it's not that. But questions aren't more important than, than supplying answers when we have the answers. So that is... Uh, uh, commandment number five. Number six, encouraging the personal search is more important than group uniformity. This one's really interesting. This is where um, you have the, you know, the anecdotal stories about, yeah, I was kicked out of a church because fill in the blank. So um, in encouraging the personal search is more important. You know what? There are some things here that if they're going on here, they are going to be addressed by the elders um, it, and the pastor, it has to. There are certain things that you're not going to, uh, to be able to, to do and still be in fellowship with us. Um, so it's not the group uniformity. That's what they're talking about there. They're, it's not um, if you're doing some wrong things that those are going to be addressed. Number seven, meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining institutions. Um, related to it, this one has to do with... Um, it's not what we believe, it's how we behave. That's very big in progressive Christianity. It's not what we believe, it's how we behave. In other words, how I act is way more important than what I believe or what I say or you know, what hills I'm willing to die on. Um, number eight, peacemaking is more important than power. And again, you kind of see this kind of theme running through here where, um, you know what? Can we do things nice? Is it important that we get along? It is, but at what price are we getting along? There, there comes a time where, um, you know what, I'm all about getting along. I don't think most people like conflict. Um, I had a previous career where literally I got paid to manage conflict. That kind of was my job. It wasn't very much fun most of the time. Um, but you know what, conflict is valid sometimes, and so you need to be prepared to do that. So that's number eight. Number nine, we're down to the last two. We should care more about love and less about sex. This is a really, really important one. You know what? We could, we could easily spend an entire uh, connect talking about sex because it, for liberal Christianity, for progressive Christianity, um, any, um, any sexual ethic at all is totally off limits. I mean, it doesn't, like, I should be able to do, it's my body, I should be able to do whatever I want whenever I want to do it, and blah, 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 blah. So this, this idea that we should care more about love. So, hey, I mean, it's a loving relationship, or um, I watched a video, um, God is Gray, this, um, this young lady, and she makes the argument that, um, and she's really engaging. I mean, she's, she's young, she's... Um, she's not unattractive. She's got a foreign accent. I mean, she's okay to listen to. Um, but she was talking about how, you know, when, when they, in the Old Testament, when um, in Exodus, where they said that, you know, homosexuality was wrong. Well, back then, they didn't have committed relationships like we do now. And so, hey, because they're, because they're really in love, and it was just a different kind of thing, um, so really subtle, but yeah, no, that's not how that works. I mean, it's, you know, those commands, and then it's not really just in the Old Testament where it talks about the sexual ethics. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 9 and 10, I believe, and definitely in Romans 1 and probably some other places as well. Um, and so this idea that um, we should care more about love and less about sex. Love is important, right? There, there's the partial truth. Um, and then the final one, and this is gigantic um, and is a good way to wrap this up. Life in this world is more important than the afterlife. Yikes. There, literally, there's not much I could get up here and say um, that would strike me as more heretical and hopefully you as more heretical. Honestly, there's nothing in this world that's as important as the afterlife. Literally, the whole reason we're here is to determine what our afterlife is. You know, eternity is a long time. We're here for however many years it is. 
Um, at probably the average age is somewhere around 80. That seems like a long time because it is in our mind, but it's not very long um, in light of eternity. And the most important aspect of our existence here is what we did with Jesus Christ because that determines where we spend eternity. So um, I categorically deny life in this world is more important than the afterlife. It absolutely is not and cannot. Is life in this world important? Yeah, and should we do good things? Um, this is where things like the social gospel and all that stuff, social justice and all that stuff come in, um, which are all related to this. So that's it for the Ten Commandments. Let me get a couple of other things in here. Um, moralistic therapeutic de deism is a, what you'll see come in a lot of times in this, and it basically it's the idea, you could take the three words and break them down. Deism is the, that God created the world, but then he kind of just sat back and let it go on its own. Um, therapeutic has to do with feeling good. That's the most important thing. This moral, I mean, that Jesus was a moral teacher. We're supposed to feel good about ourselves, and you know, God's up there, basically hands off approach. Um, so that's a really important thing. Uh, critical race theory, you see a lot about that right now. Um, intersectionality related to critical race theory, those are both part of the progressive uh, Christianity, in my opinion. And then, as I said earlier, anything. Um, related to social justice. Let me touch on one last gigantic thing. Um, if there is one tenet of progressive Christianity more than any other, and it because it is like this gigantic thing that goes in a, a bunch of different ways, um, it has to do, and a good chunk of American Gospel 2 um, addressed this, so I wanted to make sure I got this in, but had to do with um, the, the denial of the substitutionary atonement, um, which is literally... Um, there probably is not much more in this world that we can talk about than substitutionary atonement. Um, the penal substitution and what it has to do with is somebody paid the penalty um, for our sins, um, and that was Jesus. And, and like they totally like do away and don't believe that, um, that that happened. And even more offensive than that, um, they accuse God of being a moral monster or... Um, cosmic child abuse is another. You'll run across that. I guarantee if you Googled cosmic child abuse, you'd come up with like a bazillion things in about a half a second because um, God killing his son is cosmic child abuse, and so they, uh, they dismiss that out of hand. So um, I wanted to make sure I got that in there. It looks like we're probably at about a decent time. I'm going to wrap this up. Open it up for questions. Um, hopefully I can answer them. If I can't, I'm sure Patrick can. At least I'll do my best, right? All right, everybody. We are going to take a couple minutes here. Well, you will see on your screen at home the uh, Q&A for email. And obviously, you, wanna, you can comment in the live feed. Getting better at this, but I forgot to get Guy a bottle of water last week. So uh, as we plop down here... Um, What's that? It was me last week. Yeah, I didn't do it for you either. I failed you both. Good wow. job, Garlock. Um, all right, as we uh, come back now, we just want to give you the opportunity to connect at highlandheightscc.com or the live feed for uh, your comments. But, but we'd like you to put questions in there. Um, if you want to comment on things we say, it's no problem at all, but we want to make sure that you are... Um, understanding that the whole point of this is for you to ask questions, ask away. Um, if you heard something that kind of stuck out to you that Curtis talked about, and uh, then we'll do our best to answer it. And I think there's a lot there. So first of all, thank you for, for the great work you did there. Um, cosmic child abuse is the one that I, I, I heard a while back. Uh, I heard it about four years ago. I had a gentleman um, who I actually talked to from time to time. He, uh, it was on a Facebook feed somewhere and, uh, you know, with thousands of comments and this dude was just railing the people about how God was a mean, unjust God for killing his kid. And um, I, I reached out to him through Messenger and we actually sparked up a friendship. Um, he had legitimate issues, but, you know, on Facebook feeds, it's always a, it's the narcissistic attack of each other. So I wanted him to know, I'm like, dude, I, I, I hear where you're coming from, but I, I want to talk to you, and, and 
I'm like, my gloves are off, you know. I, so he, we had a good conversation, but it's never quite, it's never quite been able to get through my brain of how anybody would literally feel like God would be a beauty. Mm. If God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are three in one, then, then you know, how, how, do we, how do we all of a sudden think of it as like, you know, it's like we compare the Abraham story of sacrificing his son you know, and then right at the last second, God calls him off. God was never going to allow him to do it. He was literally getting, he was testing the faith right. it was the uh, uh, to make sure that this man is whom all people would, you know, come from that, that, that uh, be grafted into that, that body of believers. It, so it was never about him killing his own child. But for some reason, people are really hung up on that. Well, why would he even do that? Well, he didn't. That's the point. Again, when you're questioning that, you now are eliminating God's sovereignty, forgetting that God is in charge. I, and it's just a spiral that we've, right. we've run out of. And ultimately, what it is is that we forgot that God is God. All right. We're and gonna... that's what a lot of this is, is denying the deity. Or the, I mean, the very beginning of my talk was, I mean, it was denying this, this divine... Um, Lord of the universe, because that's very offensive. And you know what? If he's divine, then you have a responsibility. And F, probably a lot of this is trying to not have to, to deal with the responsibility that you owe if God is God. Yeah. Amen. Do we have any questions that have come in? None? What, did he do that good of a job to answer everything? Okay, so I, I may have a question for you. So on, on, the, on the Progressive Christianity website, okay, because there actually is a website, okay, I did not dot org, okay. updated at the end of this last year, by calling ourselves progressive Christians, we mean we are Christians who, one, you guys might remember this from our class, Jackie guy, believe the following path of the teacher, Jesus can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to God, as well as an awareness and experience of not only the sacred, but the oneness and unity of all life. Okay, starts off, doesn't sound like, all right, okay, it's kind of weird, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. no big deal. Affirm that the teachers, teachings of Jesus provides but, excuse me, but one of many ways to experience God. There we go. So in their number two, he's one of many. How do you tell, how do you respond to somebody who still to this day, okay, the, the, the Hindu, mm -hmm. the Buddhist, right, the Zen Buddhist, the, the, uh, the Muslim, they're very happy in their faith and their religion. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be content. They're not, you know, they're Muslim, but they're not clearly uh, militant. You know, they, they literally love their family. They work hard. They feel like they're close to God. Right. So, so <laughs> I guess this question comes up. It does. Well, I'm loving to play advocate this particular time. So, so what do you tell somebody who claims okay. that they, they have peace with God? So. Yeah. so one of the tenets of progressive Christianity is that there are multiple ways and that it's very offensive. Um, but the word of God is as clear as it could possibly be. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not gray. Um, now, I know, uh, I know progressive Christianity says that, I mean, just exactly what he's saying, that you, know, you have all these other religions. How come you're right and they're wrong? And cause here's the thing, is... Um, I talked a little bit earlier about logic, and like I said, I'm kind of, uh, I, I love logic. I consider myself, uh, I'm learning, but I, I really like logic. Um, and one of the foundational laws of logic is that it's the very first one you learn. It's the law of non-contradiction, and it means something can't, it can't be A and not A at the same time and in the same way. Um, now, like with most things with logic, that may not make most sense, but I can't say uh, that my pants are khaki, but they're not khaki. 
Now, I could be colorblind, and I, could, and I am colorblind. I mean, I could, and there could be another color in it, um, but I can't say it's khaki and not khaki at the same time and in the same way. And I feel the exact same way about John 14, 6. I mean, is it possible? Like, you have all these religions out there. So logically, could they all be wrong? Yes, logically, they could all be wrong. Logically, they can't all be right. And in fact, if John 14, 6 is right, then logically they are all wrong because he makes a clear, um, Jesus makes a clear statement that he is the only way to life. And so it's not Buddha and it's not Muhammad and it's not, um, it's not uh, Mary and um, the Catholic priests. I mean, it's, it, it just is not. And that part of progressive Christianity, I said at the beginning, I mean, it's a liberal Christianity, and it is not Christianity. You have forfeited the right, in my opinion, to claim the mantle of Christian when you start denying fundamental doctrines such as Jesus is the only way to God. When you, you know, Matthew 14, 6 is Jesus' reply to Thomas, obviously, that he is the way that the way, the truth, and the life, nobody can get to, to him, to the Father, but through Jesus. But 14.7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now on, from now on, you, do you know him and have seen me and have seen him? Jesus makes it very clear that he and the Father are one. So when somebody wants to, to, to you know, accuse God of cosmic child abuse, uh, they don't understand the dynamic of the incarnate Christ, God becoming human. But, you know, we always want to pigeonhole who Christ was. I mean, it, classically, throughout history. And that's the, that's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of actually allowing Christ to be who he is, who is now, by the way, everything was created through him and for him. And when he comes back, he will be the judge Yes, God the Father will be there to judge, but it says clearly that Christ will be our judge. That's giving him awful, uh, you know, big shoes there. So yeah, because he was one in, he's one in the same with the Father. He's one in unity, three in one, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's hard for us to get our brain around that, but let Jesus be who he is. And, and then you don't have to struggle so badly with 14.6. Because then you read 14 and 7. Yeah, the Trinity is, you know what? I, I think that our minds just can't fully comprehend what no. it means to be um, three in one person, or three persons, one in one God. Um, fully God, each one fully God. Um, it, like our mind, you know, we come up with these things, well, like, um, water, because water can be in three different phases. I'm a chemistry teacher. I get it, but guess what? They can't be three phases at the same time. Yeah, it doesn't work. Like, Every analogy yeah. we've come up with fails. Um, there's three parts to an egg. The shell, the yolk, and then the white. Yeah, they're not all the same. Um, everything we try to come up with to wrap our mind around the Trinity um, ultimately fails um, because it, it's, in some ways it's beyond our understanding, but incredibly important um, theologically, the fact that, yeah, when Jesus died on the cross, that he was fully God, fully man. We can't wrap our minds around that. He wasn't. 50% one and 50% another. He was 100% one and 100% the other. And that d doesn't work in anything logically in the rest of our lives. So, um, yeah, the Trinity's, uh, Trinity's tough. But, you know, if you, as you correctly said, if you just let God be God, um, then that works quite a bit better. If you struggle in life with anxiety, if you struggle in life with um, your faith walk, I highly recommend, <clears throat> pardon me, you challenge your own understanding of who you believe in. Because what I mean by that, 
Curtis just said it, 100% God, 100% man. That's 200%. How is that even possible? It's called the hypostatic union. It is something that we do not, fa- we cannot fathom. That's where I finally let go and let God literally lead my life was when I tried to quit putting him in a box. I tried to quit making sense of how was the origin of God. I allowed God to be God. And I humbled myself before him and said, you are God. And whatever you say is what you say. And I'm going to buy into it 100% because everything else has failed me. We talk about this, you know, sermons, you know, messages for communion. We talk about it in conversations. But this is something for you to ask yourself. Progressive Christianity is doing the exact opposite. Question God. Okay, well, Job did. And then, but Job knew who God was. That's why Job was angry, because he knew who God was. That's why he never cursed him. And we can go, I don't know, you got a question yet, guys? Please, would you mind working your way to the microphone for us? I was thinking of holding firm to the faith. What's that? Um, so faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God in yep. Romans 10. Yep. Okay. Microphone back up here. Okay. The woke I mean, movement and critical race theory is movement within the progressive church. Why is this so dangerous to our faith and the church? Most people see it as a good thing. Okay, can, I'm sorry, I, I missed the very beginning. Can you? The woke movement. Oh, okay, and right. And the critical and race. Critical race theory. Yeah, because the in theory, it doesn't sound like. Thank you for the question. In theory, it doesn't sound like a bad idea, right? We're just trying to be more inclusive of of people. Nobody said that you weren't supposed to love everybody. Now I'll let you tackle that bad boy. Yeah, and you know what? These would honestly require probably entire other connects to (laughs) to tackle um, critical race theory, intersectionality, (laughs) the woke church. Um, But again... Um, as I said earlier, it, it's a half truth, and it, so that's where the subtlety and that's where the dangerousness comes in. Um, you know what? If you just look at those things, they're not necessarily wrong. But when you raise the, um, because it's part of social justice, which has been around for a long time, but those would fit comfortably, um, in my opinion, under the social justice umbrella. And anything having to do with, like, social justice is not biblical justice. I mean, it's, you know, what are we to do those things? Yes, but is that the most important thing? And it's, it's not, um, and it can't be. And, you know what, you have a major denomination that I believe is going to split over this social justice stuff, and it's... Uh, it's really kind of sad and it's really kind of frightening, but like, you know, the whole woke church and all that stuff in there. Um, Nancy, you and I were talking earlier and you had mentioned something about the emergent church, which, um, you know, Brian McLaren and all the people in the emergent church, that the emergent church is part of the progressive Christianity. It's, you don't really hear too much about it anymore, but all of those guys, um, he probably being the most famous of the emergent church people, um, but fit comfortably in that progressive Christianity. So. so let me jump in there and ask you a question so that maybe the people at home would be a little more um, inspired to maybe ask a couple questions here. What's the biggest reason why it's a problem? To, to even think about questioning social justice. Okay, so because, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm completely plain, you know, DA here, right? Mm-hmm. I, I have a, a, a take issue with it for the for not because I'm white and we're talking about things that are bad happening to our our black, black brothers and sisters anywhere, but this conversation takes place only in the United States of America, and and it's not taking place in other uh, other countries nearly as much. Not to say it doesn't happen, but tell me why it's so bad. Tell me why it's so bad from a Christian perspective. Why is the social justice movement that all that? Why do we have an issue with it? So I guess my short answer is that 
it seems to be, um, while I would agree with a lot of the stuff initially in it, and honestly, it, it's my biggest problem with progressive Christianity. It's, and you know, when I was reading through those, there's part of those, um, and I feel the same way about you know, the woke church and critical race theory and all that stuff. I don't disagree with a lot of the stuff in there. Right. I just di- I disagree with the magnitude of it. I disagree with how important it is. I disagree that it is the hill to die on and anything else we're going to talk about is subservient to those things when it can't be. I mean, I mean our job here is... Um, we are to preach Christ and Him crucified. I mean, it's, you know what, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, a lot of this other stuff. Is it important? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the social justice stuff is. Should we look out for the poor? Yeah, should we? And, and I mean, you can come up here and with this long line of stuff, and I absolutely would be, yeah, we, we should be concerned about those things, but it can't be the only or the most important thing that we're concerned about. That is not what the church exists for. And, what we're, and, and I think the biggest thing, you guys, the reason why we're seeing a problem with it even now is because it's superseding the, the true meaning of what Christ um, did and who, who he is. Anything that you're putting above the true repentant faith, for instance, we all know in this room because not everybody in, in, who's gathered here or online are all white. Let's put it this way. Does it matter to Stevie Wonder and Ronnie Millsap? Helen Keller? No. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. If you're blind, it, this does not matter. This question doesn't even exist. If you're colorblind, this doesn't exist. There's the other thing. As Christians, we're teaching we're all one race from Adam. This doesn't matter. This is, we're, we're superseding a problem above the principle of freedom in Christ. If any one of us is a proclaimed believer, follower of Jesus Christ, but utters the N-word every time that we, we, we see a problem in the culture with a black guy getting arrested or something, then you, you, you clearly are not allowing Christ to reform you because that wouldn't come out of your mouth because hatred doesn't come out of your mouth as a fruit of the spirit. See, joy, love, peace, kindness, gentleness are. Do we still have, you know, hangups? Yeah, I guess we all do. I still have a problem with people who eat cottage cheese. That's disgusting. It's curdled milk. But I'm not going to let I had to throw a joke in there just to lighten it up a little bit. I like cottage cheese. Uh, yeah. I guess with lots of pepper and Melba <laughs> toast. But the point is, is that we have hang-ups with certain things. But if we're not letting that be ruin who we are in Christ Jesus, the freeness that, that, that we, we expose and that we share in Christ Jesus, then this doesn't, we're not even having this discussion. We've allowed the culture to become hateful towards God, and that's why now the woke movement was birthed. It just did. Yeah, and I mean, you know what, like the critical race theory, I mean, you know what, like I said, a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm totally okay with. Um, I believe the best-selling book from last year um, was a um, book titled White Fragility. It was written by Robin DiAngelo, um, who ironically is white. But um, in her book, she makes the, the point, the, literally the point of the book, um, at least as much as I've read of it and read at it, honestly, um, white fragility is if you're white, you're a racist. If you say you're not a racist, it's your white fragility speaking. So it's like a circular argument. Yeah, so where does it end? Right, logically, right, logically the only thing you can do is um, tuck your tail between your legs and go home, I'm, which ironically, probably is what they're looking for. Because you, the more you insist that you're not, um, the more it shows your white fragility, which is proof that you actually are. And so, it, you know what? It, you can't win for losing. It's, yeah. And it's, so, I mean, that part of it's like really, really frustrating. I mean, like, what is the end game? Um, and uh, whatever the end game is, it certainly is not... Um, well preaching Christ and him crucified. Absolutely, and it's always, the end result is what is the motive behind it? You guys have a question for us? Please go right ahead. Can't hear you, hold on. Okay, 
for a new believer, how do they know when they could possibly be teetering on progressive Christianity when they are just learning their faith walk and have questions? I think you, you whenever you become a, a believer, you're going to be working through um, lots of lots of uh, lots of baggage for a while. So I, I, I think here's the deal: is it, you have to be open enough. To when you find you need it, first of all, you can become a believer in a- anywhere, right? You repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a believer anywhere. <coughs> Pardon me. You need to make sure that you're in a Bible, a full Bible teaching church, okay? Um, we, we offer people, if they are looking for one um, here, and to be, we, we will not, we, of course, we're going to you know, invite you here. But if you're looking specifically in, in an area of town a little closer to your home or work, we'll find one for you that we agree with because we know lots of pastors in this town. If we don't, we can help you find one in your area. But the point is, you want to get in there. And, and once you get into a Bible teaching church, soak it in. And then as you begin to, to, to read the God's word and you pray, and you are listening to solid biblical instructors, don't, don't have a problem with asking anybody. We'll give you a list of 10 pastors that we totally agree will give you good um, you know, understanding of the Word of God, help you through understanding the Word of God. We always want to get you into a Bible study, a, you know, law often called small groups, but it is a concerted Bible study. Because, and then you will begin your transformation as we are told in, in, in Romans 12, 2 by Paul, to, to not conform to the ways of the world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's going to take a little while to work through. I had a, a great conversation with a, a, bro, a newer brother to the faith last night who, who was working through um, what kind of metal he can listen to. I have no problem helping him down that road because I was like, well, um, you're in luck. Um, but, you know, I gave him advice that if you try to throw everything out the window that you know, you are going to repel and revolt against God within a matter of a couple weeks or a couple of months. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of what's wrong and you know that what you're doing is incorrect, he will do the work in you and get you out of that. So I bring all that up because I think it'd be easy to sit there and go, well, we're going to give you a list of legalism right now, uh, points to follow, that you can't do that. Or get out of my church, right? Right? as they once said in, in, you know, in a movie. But I was like, that, that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to bring in our luggage and our dirt, and he will sift through that. But, but you know, it doesn't take long to be around a Bible study, nope. and you bring up something, and the guys are looking at you, and they're like, dude, you probably oughtn't be drinking before you, you know, <laughs> you know, just, you, you know we, we begin to, I guess it's just the, the part of the family of God, the fellowship is what I'm getting at. No, I'm, I love the question. Um, I, I love Patrick's answer. Um, he's absolutely correct. Um, I, I said it last week, get in the Word. Um, it's how you, everything needs to be tested in light of Scripture. Um, the better you know God's Word, the less you're going to fall prey. And the scary thing about progressive Christianity is it's, it's these partial truths. I mean, it is, a, I think Michael Kruger um, defined it as a master class in partial truths. And partial truths are not truths, they're lies. Something partially true. But get in a Bible-believing church, that's it. I mean, get around people, like, I guarantee you're not going to get the progressive gospel from your elders and pastor at this church. I mean, we... We care deeply about this, and we do our due diligence. We're studying, and I mean, we're reading. And um, but then the other part of that is ask questions. Um, you know, I said at the very beginning, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the smartest person up on the stage right now. But I'm pretty well read. I'm a pretty good resource person, and I'm more than happy. Uh, I'm more than happy if I can't tell you the answer. Um, I'll tell you, I don't know the answer to that, but I will get you an answer to it. I will commit to that. This is a beautiful part about being a family of believers is yep. that, you know, that's why an elder-run church is so very and vitally important to the New Testament church moving forward. It's not, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people and they're like, well, you're, 
you know, you just need to tell us what you need, you know, what needs to happen. Uh, no, no, I don't. I will recommend to these guys, but they are, we are equals together. That's why he set it up that way in the New Testament. That's why it's that way. I'm, yeah, you got to have a leader. I, I guess that would be me, right? But I'm not, I'm not above them. I'm with them. And that's the key. As you put yourself around other believers, it feeds you. It holds you accountable. And I am able to hold them accountable. Okay? So thank you for the question. And be a Berean. I mean, that's... What is that? In the New Testament. The Bereans were, were lauded for... Um, they tested everything in light of Scripture. They heard something. I said this last week, and I, I don't know if it came across the right way, but you know what? What Patrick says, and I mean, I know his heart, and I mean, I know he, he wants to, I mean, God speaking through him, I mean, the Holy Spirit speaking through him when he delivers this message, and I, and I believe that that's happening. Um, he, we both admitted that we had made mistakes, um, and, but when they do, I mean, you know, by all means, point it out. I, I'm willing to make a correction. I'm willing to, you know, take the hit on that because I want to get God's word right. Um, and I want to I wanna be a good disciple of his. But test everything in light of scripture. Amen. Not just the stuff that, you know, that, the stuff that's easy. Like I, I've said before, um, the prosperity gospel is so outrageous that it, sometimes I'm stunned at how people fall prey to it. I'm not stunned at all about people falling prey to progressive Christianity. It's very, very... Yeah, um, it's, it's appealing. It's very subtle. Well, it's and, appealing. And very appealing. But... Do you guys have another one for us? Test it in light of no? Scripture. Anybody in-house have one? As we, um, we're going to work, I think we might have one more. So before we, we, we let the last question come in... I want to say this, um, test everything in light of scripture. Um, I'm looking forward to that because I'm getting ready to, you know what the topic is this week, right? The sermon? I do not. What is the rapture? Okay. I should since, Fun I'm, times. since I'm the elder. Fun times so. ahead. But anyway, you know, we were talking about it today in our class earlier. We have a, an apologetics class. Here's the thing. If people do not like what content they hear in a sermon, which I am deriving from scripture, then please come and sit down. And let's talk through it. And if you have a different opinion and you have scripture to support it and you see it differently, we're still brothers and sisters in the end. That's the beautiful part of this. But if I'm not challenging the congregation and they're not challenging me, we are not sharpening each other's iron, which is a commandment in the word of God. Yeah. We are to, iron sharpens iron. It is a must. We don't, we're not always going to believe with each, in each, you know, each other's stuff. So with that said, we have an in-house question. We're going to... Go to yeah. before we finish. Quick question on uh, what I see and, and respond to this is how you see fit. The, the problem that we have right now is everything is about a, a feeling. Yeah. And, and so that's what I see most often is that in all, the, all these movements, it's about stifling a feeling and, and making a feeling occur and uh, not necessarily getting to the truth of the matter. So I, I think that you know, maybe you could rate those churches versus other churches in that area. Well, yeah, and I, I was going to answer your, I'll answer your question with some scripture, um, which is always the best way to answer any of that. Well, as far as rating that too, and, I, I, and I, I'll let you kind of maybe throw that down. Let me, let me read this passage for you, because um, I was kind of hoping a question like this would come in tonight. Uh, Marks of a true Christian, it comes from the, Rome, uh, the 12th chapter of Romans, but, but I love this part where Paul says, let love be genuine. I want you to hear me at home on this one. Let love be genuine. If you're letting love be genuine, then, then you're not worried about making a mistake and running somebody off. Look, if somebody walks in the sanctuary and doesn't get greeted and they leave and they swear that they're a friend, they're never coming back. The greeting isn't the problem. The music wasn't a problem. The message wasn't a problem. Their sin is the problem. You're going to go to exactly where you're meant to call, you're called to be. And I pray, oh, I pray that you are convicted when you leave here on Sunday. Because I am. Because it's not what I'm doing. Lou, you could, put a, you could put a sheet over me or cloak me. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is who, the words going forward, the Holy Spirit is who's convicting us. 
That's, that's what we're, we're asking God to do whenever we hear the spoken word or whenever we present ourselves in, in worship. We were having a discussion yesterday. Worship is not, the, the music team is not the worship team. They are the praise team as part of worship. Communion is worship. Prayer is worship. Hearing scripture being taught is worship. The sermon message is worship. Um, the elder meditation, giving is what this is all part of worship. It's obedience. So it's not the music, you know, you're like, well, I wish the worship was a little bit better. Well, then you better go find a different church, no matter where you are, because you're never going to be satisfied. All right. The other question was about the, the levels of it. So, so feelings, I'm, you know what? If you're an adult, you should have figured out a long time ago that your feelings might get you into trouble. Um, scripture tells us that the heart is desperately wicked. It is deceitful above all things. You cannot trust your heart. Yeah, amen. Um, and when you do, because a lot of this stuff, and you probably in the Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity, you probably saw that weaving its way through there. That's what it was. Hey, um, let's... It's, they're in love. I mean, why not? Why should you not be able to marry whoever you want to marry? Because um, they love each other, and they're committed to the relationship. It's not like it was back in the Old Testament. And um, your feelings will get you in trouble most of the time, probably, if you Amen. follow your desperately wicked heart. I, I, I can't tell you this enough, you guys, that, you know, the, if you've not been reading the word of God enough that I, I, I just literally preached for three minutes or two minutes, whatever, on half a verse, which was let love be genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, hate what is evil is the back half of that. And then it finishes with in verse nine, hold fast to what is good. Cling to what is good. Yep. It goes on to say, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Does this sound like bad advice? How about, how about this? Do not be, not be lazy in zeal or slothful. Be fervent in spirit. Fervent. 1.30 in the morning, Saturday, Sunday morning. I woke up at 1.30, and I'm like, no, really, God? I've just been asleep for an hour, two and a half hours. I, but I knew that I needed to do something, so you know what I did? I rolled off the side of the bed onto my lab, and he got up and got mad at me. And I began to pray, and I prayed for like probably 30 minutes. I just quietly prayed, don't be slothful in your prayer time. I, and I don't remember the last time I prayed for 30 minutes in the middle of the night. It was great. It was great. I needed it. But anyway, it goes on. Again, this is in Romans 12. It's called Marks of a True Christian in the ESV Bible. It's subtitled, and it goes on to not repay evil with evil, to honor who, you know, uh, evil with good, pray for one another. These are all parts... This is what we must do, and if we're doing that, then trying to appeal to the culture is not our place. And, and I know that makes everybody angry, but I thought, it was, I thought it was wonderful. This is a little bit of a testimony. I had a real tough conversation with our youth group about a week ago, and I'm not going to go into any of that, but it was a difficult conversation with a few um, of the kids, and there's always a lot of difficult conversations because our kids are going through so much. Man. Dude, I, I thought I had a bad growing up. I had nowhere near what they have nowadays. They're under so much pressure and, and, and this, just this painful place that so many of them are, are dealing with. There's a lot of them that are doing good with it, but a lot of them aren't. Here's the point. A couple of the kids, when they left last week, um, told their mom, they said, I don't know why they, uh, one of them was challenging Pastor Patrick. He's never going to get off the point. I mean, he's always going to, he ain't changing his mind on it. The word of God is the word of God. And I was just so blessed by hearing that from them, from the mom. She's like, yeah, they said you weren't going to back off of that. I can't because my job is not to appeal to the culture. My job is to teach the word of God. And I'm going to make f plenty of non-fans and lots of enemies. I can't worry about that. And it hurts me to think that way in our previous life. We never wanted to make anybody upset. Oh, no. Don't want to make anybody upset now. But it's inevitable when you're teaching the word of God. Because we're after their, their, their freedom, you know? Yeah, if, anyway. you're, if you're not uh, making people angry, uh, because you know what? We are called to be countercultural. 
Mm -hmm. The culture is its thing. Actually, I think that's the title of a book by David Platt. I'm not positive, but um, I can kind of see the cover now, which is rather bizarre. So, um, but we are called to be countercultural. The culture is the culture. Um, we are called to be counter to that. That is not, and we should expect, we should expect the culture to not follow. And it's getting worse all the time. I mean, you can look around. It, things aren't getting better. Um, but we are called to be countercultural, and you know what? That's what we're going to do here. And I, and I think the, the worst thing that we can do, you know, there's been a, a wave of, um, without getting into the terminology of it, but a thing called dispensationalism, which has done, a, I think, a great disservice to a lot of the evangelical church from the last 100 years, 50 years especially, because I think what it's done is it's made us a little bit more lazy because we're waiting, we're waiting, you know, for God, and we just kind of expect that the, um, you know, the why bother mentality. Well, the Titanic's already going down. There's no sense in rearranging the deck chairs. That is not yeah. our call. Our mm -hmm. call is to, to disciple-make every single day. Our job is to feed the poor and the homeless. Our job is to minister to people. You get quiet, lazy, and get in a bunker, you are doing, you, you got to answer to God for that. And we will call people out for that and call people to that faithful repentance of going, okay, 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 I've gotten somewhat lazy in this. Your job is not to be lazy. Your job is not to retire. I, I will never, ever actually retire. I won't. Now, I know that I will be kicked out from this position at some point, but I will not retire in, 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 in my discipleship. I can't. It is inbreded in me. I, will, I got, I got to, to do this the rest of my life, and I want to because I finally submitted and surrendered myself unto God and said, I, I'm, I'm yours for life. What can I do? When you begin to do that, it changes everything. I you could be I could name movies like that. I could tell you years. I could tell you when every Paul Newman movie ever was released. It was pretty impressive. I forgot it now because I don't watch TV hardly ever anymore. I am bored. I want to read. I want to talk to people. I want to pray. I want to I don't expect people to be as a freak like me on it, but I'm changing is my point. Because I've, I've surrendered. I, I don't even know why I went into all that detail. But the point, <laughs> I just want to know people, what people think. You know, where's that guy's headspace at? That's what it is. But what is that from? It's because we're surrendering to God. Yep. We're not worried about the culture, and we're trying to yep. teach the gospel. Yep. Any more questions, you guys? We've gone over a little bit. We've always gone an hour. Dude, closing words, man. What do you got for them? Um, you know what? It's, it's out there. You see this. Ask questions. Promise I'll do my best to get you an answer if uh, if something comes. If you uh, if you're wondering if something is um, part of the progressive Christian movement, if it doesn't sound quite right, or if you're just not sure, uh, please reach out. Um, we are here to. That's the reason we do these. Is this gives us another opportunity um, to hopefully disciple you um, as you. Uh, begin your walk with Jesus or wherever you are to help you grow closer with Jesus. And so uh, I would just invite those. Um, doesn't matter when they come in. If uh, Gage gets them to me, I promise I'll get you an answer. We're going to update our Connect topics by tomorrow um, about the, there's some new ones that are coming in. It'll run us to the end of, um, actually, end of March, into the beginning of April. I know that we got one that I want to do on wine, women, and songs so that Larry can talk about, you know, the, 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 the coming out of the old life and into the new. I think it would be a really great topic to talk about what it's like and how scared we are of literally giving up our old habits. Mm -hmm. We don't ever talk about that. Yep. People obviously, not, a lot of times, will not walk into a church because, quite honestly, they don't want to stop drinking on Saturday night. Tell me I'm wrong. There's people all the time who are like, uh, I, I got to get, get a little right before I come into church. Dude, I, if I said it once, we'll say it a thousand times. You do not take a bath before you take a shower, and you cannot cook that fish until you clean it. You can try, but it's disgusting. Here's the point, is you got to come to God dirty. you got to walk in here full of sin, full of gnarliness, and just, and just, just let him do a work in you. Yeah. Right? But we, how many brothers and sisters have we met that are like, oh my goodness, I, I can't go to church. I'm so gnarly. We want them to. So I think Brother Larry would be great. We got another one coming up too that Brother Guy will be, will be teaching us on. 
And uh, Curtis, you got another one, I think, lined up, don't you? I don't think so. No, I think we just lined you up for another uh, one. Okay. I think I was, we just I was thinking, suckered you into like, another mm, one. All right. Uh, I would also like to talk to, about money um, problems sometime, about how, how important it is to be good stewards. And I think our brother John would be wonderful to sit up here and answer lots of questions and being able to just help you just understand, you know, budgeting. I think people today in this day and age, we're just not sure how to do our family. We're not sure how to live life. And I think we have a lot of really good resources here with our elders and with our rest of our church family. So we'll be sure to try to start tying in some new topics to you and if we don't have it up by tomorrow, we'll have it up by Saturday. That way I can nail all the, uh, all the elders on Saturday morning at our meeting, and then we can figure that out. So Lord bless you guys. Thanks for joining us tonight on Connect, and we will see you uh, next Thursday night. Gage, what's the topic next week? Man, see, I told him to have it ready to go. I didn't. I didn't actually tell him, man. I was just messing with you. We, we, I was thinking it was an exciting topic here, but I have a new phone, and I haven't figured out how to get to the website again. <laughs> All right, uh, but it's not harming anyone, is it? And then it's a topic discussing about the perils of pornography and how to find help out of it. Pornography is something that affects more women today than men ever did before. It's actually a problem for women, uh, or I should say it doesn't affect it more than men. It's more, uh, more women are addicted to yep. pornography than ever before as compared to men. It used to just be a man's thing, but yep. not any longer. Uh, pornography can definitely ruin you. It can ruin how you look at other people, and it can really, really hurt you with God. And we, wanna, we don't want to call anybody out. What we're going to do is show you the, um, how to get freedom out of this, and it's going to take some serious effort, okay? So Lord bless you guys. We'll be dealing with a wonderful topic of that next week. So, um, you know, anything we can help you guys with understanding how to get freedom from sin, we're going to do. We're going to pray. Thank you, Father God, for bringing us together. Thank you for the opportunity to help um, anybody understand what are the perils out there in our world um, from progressive Christianity and just, you know, letting people run rampant with you and your word and pick and choose what they want uh, to people who are addicted to pornography and wanting to get away from the bondage of it. Lord, there is so much out there for us up against it in the world, against our flesh, the world, and the devil. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to minister to us and help this to become uh, this connect to, to, to address issues that you want um, uh, discussed and that we can, we can help other people come out of their uh, sinful bondage. And we just ask this all in your holy, perfect, and precious name. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory. Amen.